Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome to Lawyer Live with Matt the Lawyer. I am Matt the Lawyer, Matt Johnston, coming to you from a finally springtime Frederick, Maryland. I wanted to quickly remind everybody, if you'd like to see some other content, things that, that I've been working on, please go over to the website, www.mattthelawyer.com. You'll be able to check out some of the other content that I have up there, as well as sign up for our monthly newsletter, or maybe semi-monthly newsletter, but our electronic newsletter that you're going to be able to uh, receive information from me on a regular basis, so you can even see some of my back content. A few weeks ago, I posted a, a text blog post uh, dealing with the, co the concept of customer experience, user experience. I used the Disney experience quite a bit as a, a model for how people could go about worrying about how they interact with their customer, what their customer experience is on a day-to-day -day basis. And businesses can use their contracting process as a way to improve customer experience because it's a nice, simple, easy way of doing it that almost nobody pays attention to. But one of the questions that comes up is like, okay, that sounds like a great idea. How do I do that? Well, there's a fellow by the name of Frank Sonnenberg. I'm going to put his blog post in the uh, user in the comments down below, in the show notes and on the blog post for this video. And he talks about 13 ways to demonstrate honesty. And a couple of those things really apply to what happens in the contracting process. One of the things that often happens with contracts and contract drafting and dealing with the customers, we don't really think about the customer so much. I've been arguing that, yes, you really should pay attention to what your customer wants and needs. But how do you communicate that with your customer? And a couple of the points that Sonnenberg makes is that you should be looking at things from an honest viewpoint. So what does that look like? Well, one of his points is something that we often hear day in and day out is say what you mean, mean what you say. For me, as a contract drafter, what that means is you have got to take a look at what it is you're trying to say and say it in as clear a fashion as possible. If that means you, you need to use five 10-word sentences instead of one 30-word sentence, you want to avoid big phrases or lots of, as a friend of mine called them, 50-cent words. Those are the kinds of things that you want to do. Be specific about what you're trying to say and say it. That also goes into the next sort of point that Sonnenberg makes, which is simplify your statements. There are times when I read a contract that the sentences are so long, and some of them are hundreds of words long, I've often forgotten what a period actually looks like they are so long. But a lot of times... The best contracts are the ones that use simple, declarative, short sentences as a mechanism for managing how they do things, how they write things, how they express ideas. This way we can understand what the message is. Now, a fair number of my colleagues in the bar will say that, well, a contract often deals with complex ideas. Well, that may be true. A contract may be complex. It may represent a complex deal. It may be a complex part of the deal. And my argument is that that's when you need to be simple statements, clear statements, so that people can understand what is being said and done. Another thing that Sonnenberg talks about that I particularly like is this concept that he explains as... Um, Tell the people the rationale behind what you're saying. Okay. A lot of times in a contract, one of the questions that comes up is, why, are we, why am I saying this? Why am I writing this in there? Let me give you a really good example. Uh, a number of my clients deal with nonprofit organizations. Nonprofit organizations are fantastic, but when you're dealing with a nonprofit organization that's run by a board that doesn't have paid staff that my clients are going to be working with day in and day out, there becomes a problem called communications. If you send something to the board of directors, you get nine different pieces of feedback. 
And how is my client or a service provider supposed to understand what's real feedback, what's different feedback, what can I ignore, what do I need to incorporate? And oftentimes, some of the feedback is contradictory. My clients are not marriage counselors, nor are they business counselors. They're providing a service. So how do you do that? Well, I often include a provision in the contract called a communications point of contact, which basically says, if I don't receive it, communication from this particular point of contact about what we're supposed to do as a service provider, I can ignore everybody else. That enables them to force the nonprofit organization to at least collaborate and communicate before giving directions to the service provider. Now, it'd be very easy to just put that into the, into the sentence or into the, the contract and say, that's the contract term, you have to deal with it. But a simple sentence that says the reason why we're asking for a single point of contact is so that you guys operate with one voice. It encourages you to come to discussions and decisions before you start giving us direction. If you give us different directions, it's going to cost you more money. Something as simple as that. And being clear about that intention and being clear about that rationale goes a long way to helping customers understand why particular terms are in the contract. Being open and honest and truthful about what's going on is vitally important. Another key point that I try and tell people is when you're dealing with a customer and you're dealing with what that contract is going to say, one of the most important things to do is not foist off fault, not blame somebody else. Own those risks that are yours. A contract involves a lot of risk assessment, risk allocate, allocation, and description of the various risks. Some of those risks my clients should be taking on. Those are the responsibilities that they have as a service provider. They have the ability to control the risk. They should own the risk. Uh, a good case in point, I was reviewing a contract for a client who was hiring an IT services firm. The IT services firm said that we're not going to be responsible for mistakes for software that we design that's custom for you. And I was telling my client that is absolutely improper and you shouldn't accept anything like that. If this contractor, this IT contractor, designs something specific to your needs, which is possible, that contractor controls how that's going to operate. They control the work that went into that. They control the process. Therefore, they should carry the risk. If they design a software that once installed completely demolishes my client's network so that my client can't operate, that's not my client's fault. And of course, the contractor should be accepting responsibility and accepting liability for that. Hold people accountable for the things they should be accountable for. So when you're thinking about your contract terms and what you want to include in there, think about things from the viewpoint of trust, of honesty. The purpose of a contract is to create clear communications, clear understanding, and to promote trust between the parties to the contract. Trust is generated when people understand your motivations, so be clear about the rationale behind the language. Their trust is generated when you are clear about your intentions, about the rules of the contract, and trust is created when you own those things that are yours to own. Don't foist them off upon the client or the customer. Alrighty, in the meantime, I hope everybody has a great weekend, a great time, and go out and watch some live soccer. In the meantime, this is Matt the Lawyer signing off. I'll talk to you all later.